Father, we come into your presence today. We are so grateful for your love and your mercy. We are so grateful for our forgiveness that comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. Father, I thank you that like the stories we just saw illustrated in this song, that forgiveness is available to every person here today. Not one person has to leave this place with the burden of sin over their life. Father, I thank you that in your word, you said that Jesus canceled our debt, which listed all the rules that we had failed to follow. He took away the record with its rules and he nailed it to the cross. Father, I thank you that when Jesus was nailed to that tree, between his body and that cross was my sin. And everything that I've ever done, everything anyone has ever done in this room, Father, that they can leave this place having received true forgiveness because you love them. So, Father, we come today celebrating Jesus, celebrating his amazing love. And, Father, I pray that not one person leaves this place without experiencing your power and your presence and the redemption that Jesus shed his blood for. And, Father, we thank you today for a resurrected Christ, a resurrected Savior that rose from the grave, conquered death, seated at the right hand of the Father on high, ever living to make intercession for us. Thank you for a risen Savior that Jesus is alive. Amen. Isn't it good to worship a risen Savior? Incredible, incredible, incredible. Hey, well, happy Easter to you, and you can be seated. And as you do, would you give a hand to our worship team and thank them for what they've done and what they do? Thank you, guys. What an incredible, what an incredible time. It's, we're so glad you've taken the time this, uh, this Easter morning to be with us as a church and uh, celebrate the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, here's my hope today, is that you don't come and this just becomes, you know, like a, a religious thing that you do maybe on Easter. And it's my hope that no matter what brought you here today, that truly you experience, I mean you experience the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. But, you know, religion can often do things in our life that, that take away the reality of God. And that's what I want to make sure doesn't happen today. It's my heart's desire that you don't leave here today with just having kind of a, a, done the religious thing. Jesus didn't die so that you could be religious. He really died so that you could know him, so you could experience debt cancellation, having your sin canceled. Let me illustrate it to you this way. Anybody like going to the beach? How about in January or February? It's awesome, isn't it? This January, Michelle and I uh, celebrated uh, our 25th wedding anniversary. Actually, it was a year and a half after the 25th, but we, we finally got away and we went to Antigua in January. And that's in the, in the southern part of the Caribbean. And I just have to tell you that when you're in, uh, on, a, on, a, on an island and it's beautiful and you're in the Caribbean and you look on your weather app and, and it's like two at home, <laughs> it feels so much better. How many of you know when you go in the winter away, you want, it, you want it to be, you just want it to be miserably cold and snowy when you left, right? But here's what religion does. Religion is like going to the beach with your friends or your family or like in our case, Michelle and I celebrating an anniversary. And you, uh, you go to the beach, but you go into your room alone. You don't go with the people that you came with. You don't come with, if you came with your wife or your spouse, you go in your own room. You close the drapes, the blinds, everything. No windows are open. And you, and you literally, here's what you do. You put up pictures of the people that you came with. You put up pictures of the beach. Now, you could at any time open up those, the drapes and literally be looking at the ocean. Walk out your door and walk on that beautiful, lovely, soft, warm sand. It's awesome. But, but what religion does is it puts you in the room, puts a bunch of pictures around you, and, and you never leave the room. Now, nobody would do that. A lot of times people come to this church and they'll say, where are all the symbols? Now, I don't see, you know, well, we have, well of course, we have crosses on the building. And, 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 but here's the reality. This church doesn't exist for symbols. Jesus didn't die. So you could come into a building made with hands of men and women and look for symbols of God. It's not why he came. He came so you could experience him. That no longer would you have to look at symbols. 
the living God would live in you. Well, let me give you a, an example that might be even more relevant. Anybody here have a mortgage? I'm sorry to ruin your Easter. How about a car payment? How about anybody have some lovely school loans? What if today, as an Easter gift to you, this is awesome, because you're here at the, at the Sunday morning Easter service, Steve Moore. <laughs> Pastor Steve Moore. Stand up, Steve Moore. I wanted to see who you are, son. Stand up. Stand, stand up, son. You're a fine human being. He is a good man when he's sound asleep. He is incredible. Steve Moore is going to assume every debt you have today. Isn't that awesome? He's going to give you his email, his, his home address, and all you've got to do is send everything to him. He's going to do all the paperwork just by himself because he's such a good guy. And your debts are going to be canceled. Everything you owe within the next 30 days will be completely paid off. How many of you would say Happy Easter? <laughs> Talk about a financial resurrection, right? Now, here's, here's what religion does. Religion gives you that fact that if that were a reality. And, and you could try. He might do it. You never know. But the bills come the next month and you keep paying them. How many of you know when your mortgage is paid off? How many of you know if they mistakenly send you another payment and you get a phone call and somebody on the other phone who, who is from another country but tells you they have an English name? <laughs> you ever do that? And it's just wonderful. And they're just the sweetest people, but you know that the guy's name's not Bob. <laughs> and, and Bob tells you, you know, you're late on your payment. You say, Bob, I'm paid in full. Bob said, but we really would like if you'd send more. How many of you would say, well, you know what? Let's just keep paying our mortgage. Is there anybody here, when your mortgage is paid off, your car is paid off, your school loans are paid off, you keep paying the payment? Anybody at all? I wouldn't. But do you know that's what religion has caused people to do? Jesus has taken your sin. He nailed it to a tree, nailed it to the cross, taken the, the, the handwriting, the Bible said, of the ordinances written against you. And people keep trying to pay for their own sins. People keep trying to work it out with God. It's like going to the beach with pictures and, or getting your debts paid off and keep making the payments. Every person needs to understand. Everybody longs to be forgiven. Everybody. It is the human heart's cry to, to be forgiven. It, it's so, every child, every child longs to be forgiven by their parents when they miss it. Sometimes things don't go right in relationships. Sometimes a child will grow up and through, through things they've done or things that have happened, they become estranged from their parents. And, and, and there's a separation between them. And in and, and the case I'm speaking of now, it's when the child has done things that have offended the parents and the parents may have even had to put up certain boundaries and, and it's difficult. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, who's, uh, I, I have to be honest with you, I don't read a lot of Hemingway stuff, but uh, he wrote a book called Capital of the World, which he tells a story in the book. It's kind of more of a joke in Spain, but, but the, the nation of Spain, but, but it's still, to me, it's, it's, it's very sad. And Hemingway tells about a man and his son that were estranged, and his name was, the young man's name was Paco. And Paco is a very, very common name in Spain, like John would be in America. And so Paco's father puts out a full-page ad in the local newspaper that says, Dear Paco, all is forgiven. Meet me in front of the newspaper office this Saturday night at 8 o'clock. I love you. All is forgiven. Now, here's, the, here's the, the, the end of that story. The next Saturday night at 8 o'clock, there were 800 Pacos looking for forgiveness from a father. Now, it's, it's a joke, but there's a desperation in people to be forgiven. It's, it's the heart cry of every person to have that cleansing in their life, to live outside of the, pr the prison when, you, when you're not forgiven. Every one of us long to be forgiven. We long to be forgiven in all of our relationships. Is anybody married? Okay, I didn't mean to ruin your Easter again, but let me ask you, I'm sorry. Is anybody here married? Anybody have some kids? How about some relationships? If you ever offended your spouse, okay, let me try the honest side of the room. Have you ever offended your spouse? 
Now, there are times usually in a, in a marital relationship when there's enough blame to go around. But have you ever just been the one that's 100% stupid? Anybody like, besides me? Y'all just lying on Easter. Look at that. <laughs> and you know your spouse can just, man, you just did stupid. And you just said something completely stupid. And they can either just bury you or they could say, you know what? Because how many of you know when you say, I didn't mean it? What do you hear? Yes, you did. Or you wouldn't have said it. But how many of you know when you hear this? Yeah, I've been married to you a long time. I know you have a tendency to go stupid every once in a while. And I still love you. But I know your heart. And I know that you spoke that. I know you said that out of frustration because you don't want to die. <laughs> no. But your, your spouse looks up and, and I forgive you, honey. Just forget about it. How many of you know that's a real good day? Isn't it? Your, how many, anybody here ever, ever mess up where your kids are concerned? You might be in this room and, and, and have done things in your life that have da damaged your kids. And you live under that burden. And, and you're, you're desperate to see that change. In fact, you may have just given up on changing it and just put yourself in a, a self-imposed prison the rest of your life. All of us, all of us long to be able to do things rightly for our kids. I don't know about you all, the hardest emotion that I've ever found to process in my life is the emotion of regret. I think back to when our kids were little and I was working ridiculous hours and some of it was necessary, but a lot of it wasn't. And I, my life was out of balance. And, and, and how many of you know everybody's messed up? You so say, I'm not messed up. Well, that's your problem right there. Everybody has stuff. Problem is, when you have stuff, sometimes you don't know you have it. So I was just so busy, and I missed in those early years with my kids so much. And I've sat down with my kids, and, and my son particularly, because he was the oldest, and, uh, and I've apologized. I said, I, if I could go back, I'd do anything to change the amount of time that I wasted. And you know how gracious it is? Like when my son looked back at me, and he said, Dad, look, I realize that you regret some of those things that you weren't here. And, and it wasn't like I, I didn't move to like California. It's just, I, I just wasn't connected. And, and, and I just was so busy. And, and he said, Dad, I love you and I forgive you. And look, we have a great relationship. And, I was, and he'd tell me all the good things in our house and in our life. And, 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 and forgiveness is an amazing thing. And, and yet, here's the reality. Sometimes people don't forgive. Sometimes the people that you need to forgive you aren't even alive anymore. And you can live under this burden. It can destroy your whole life. Everybody desires to live in, in the context of being forgiven. The most important aspect of forgiveness, the most important, the one that on which all others hinge is that you know what it means to be forgiven by God. Now, there are two simple areas today that I want you to leave with having experienced something from God. Everyone say experience. I'm talking to you not about a theory, not about some religious sermon. I want you to experience two things today. I want you to know when you leave this place that you have experienced forgiveness from God. And then secondly, I want you to leave this place having forgiven yourself. That's why out all, all in the mall ways, you're, you see what look like picture frames hanging from the ceilings at the word forgiven at the bottom. Before, before you leave today, it's my hope that you'll, you'll, you'll jump in front of that frame and have someone grab your phone and take your picture and post it on, on, on your Facebook or whatever social media you do and, and proclaim this when you leave in picture form, that you memorialize it. I'm leaving here. I'm forgiven by the grace and the mercy of God. Two things I want you to understand today. How to know that you're forgiven by God. And number two, how to forgive yourself. But your struggle today, guys, is not going to be the, av the availability of God's forgiveness, but your capacity to receive it. It's not God's av uh, uh, capacity. It's not God's heart to forgive. It's that can you believe the love that he is toward you? Can you believe the mercy and the grace that's extended to you through Jesus Christ? Jesus talked about forgiveness in the story I'm about to read to you, and it parallels every one of our lives. Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, 
she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. And Jesus answered. He didn't say it out loud, but Jesus answered him. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed, uh, owed money to a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii, another 50 denarii. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. L listen to that. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled both of their debts. He canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will, uh, will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman, he said, and then he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. That doesn't mean his feet were thirsty. Okay, it was a, in that day, you didn't have shoes like we wear today. There were more kind of open sandal type shoes. When you would go into a home, it was customary for, as a place of honor that they would give you the opportunity to wash your feet. And if they were to honor you, they would have someone wash your feet for you. And so he said, then he, and he said, you didn't give me any water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from, time, from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. In, in, in the Middle Eastern culture, as it is today, when you greet someone in, in the Middle Eastern culture, you kiss each other on the cheek both, two times. I have Middle Eastern friends that every time they see me, they come and they kiss me on both cheeks. Men, and, and it, not just women, men. In fact, uh, Christopher Alam, who's been here, his birth name is uh, Muhammad Alam. He's now a believer in touching the world with the gospel. Every time Christopher comes and sees me, he calls me Habibi which is a, 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 an Arab word for, for like precious friend, and he kisses me on both cheeks. This wasn't the kind of, our culture's a little different over here. But Jesus said, she's not stopped kissing my feet. Verse 46, he said, you did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her sins I ha have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven you. Now, the religious people went nuts when he did that. But I want you to see a parallel in the story. Here we have a woman who has a, a horrible lifestyle behind her. Most Bible scholars agree this woman was a prostitute, which means that the jar or the, uh, the alabaster box of perfume that she brought, and the Bible tells us that that, that jar of perfume was, it was worth a year's wages. Now, look, can I ask you, if you're a prostitute, how do you earn money to buy the perfume? So Jesus permitted a woman to touch him. This is the Holy Son of God who was a prostitute who then honored him with the fruit of her wages by taking what was precious to her and pouring it out on his feet. In fact, in that culture, when much of the use of the perfume in that culture was to identify a prostitute. That you would walk past someone and there would be this strong sense or smell and it would draw you along with what she wore. And, and Jesus permitted someone, and this that was that broken, to love him. Now the Pharisee named Simon began to do what people do today. He began to look at the woman and thought he was better than she was. And here was his thought. If this man were really a prophet of God, he wouldn't let this kind of human being come near him because she is a sinner. Simon's deception was, is that he thought he wasn't. But Jesus made it very clear. He said, Simon, both of you have a debt and neither one of you can pay it. And the reason that she's acting this way is because she knows that I'm forgiving her of this overwhelming debt. Simon thought his debt was less and it's not. There's two ways to approach forgiveness. Like this woman with humility, to come before God and to be grateful that, that he hung on a cross 
and paid the debt that you could never pay and offered up his very own life in a sacrifice to pay the debt for your sin. Or you can do what Simon did. You can become self-righteous. You can begin to say, well, you know what? I, I'm a pretty decent person. I, you know, I'm better than most. I, 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 you look, I, 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 I raise my kids. I go to work. I mean, look, I'm not a criminal. I mean, come on, I'm a decent guy. I mean, look, I think when God weighs it all and all the humans that have ever lived, I'm going to be on the pretty decent side. And he's going to say, all right, come on in because you aren't as lousy as those other people. But here's the reality. The Bible said that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is not one righteous. No, not one. None of us can cleanse ourselves of our own sin. None of us can reduce and, and eliminate the cancel and cancel that debt, that sin, debt, and burden that we carry. But Simon thought he could. You might be here today and think, well, I must be a Christian. I must, God must, must accept me. I mean, I've been to church. I'm all for going to church. I'm a pastor. It's important that you go in a church that will tell you about how good God is and help you grow and, and help your kids grow spiritually. That's important. But coming to church won't make you a Christian. Yeah, but I was baptized as a baby. That's a wonderful thing. But you can put wa water on a baby till they're waterlogged. It won't make them a Christian. You have a wet baby. Getting water baptized doesn't do anything for you as a child. Now, it can be a wonderful sacred ceremonial thing, and, and that's wonderful, and I don't say don't do it. I'm just telling you, don't kid yourself because someone dumped water on you when you didn't have a choice that you're a Christian. Well, I was baptized a Christian. Well, that's wonderful. What are you now? Well, I've been confirmed. Great. Didn't make you a Christian. I, I, I have, I've taken communion. Awesome. Doesn't make you a Christian. But I'm a member of a church. Great. Doesn't make you a Christian. I served in a church. I worked in the nursery. Awesome. None of that makes you a Christian. No church, including this church, no sacrament of any church, including this church, can make you right with God. And that's exactly what Simon was trying to do. He was self-righteous. I'm better than most. But this precious woman just said, have mercy on me. And Jesus spoke words to her that you can't experience today. Listen to me. You are forgiven. But it has to be received. Forgiveness is an amazing thing in your life. When you walk in the forgiveness that Jesus provided for you, burdens fall off of your life. That's why the scripture said, here's God's view of you when you come to Jesus. That as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sin and transgressions from you. He said, your sins and your iniquities, listen now, I will remember no more. It's not that our sin wasn't egregious. It wasn't that our sin didn't demand judgment. It did demand judgment. But our sin and the judgment of our sin fell on the altar of a cross on the spotless Son of God. And all of the wrath of God that was due me was poured out on him on that cross. And he died on that cross, was buried, and we celebrate today the resurrection. Can I tell you this? That a resurrected Christ that you haven't received is dead to you. There is no way for eternal life to be a part of you except you invite Jesus, the person, into your heart. Because all of your good works, all of your church stuff, as wonderful as that is, I'm not saying go be a criminal. But I'm telling you that your good works, you can't earn it. Jesus said both of them owed a debt. Neither of them could pay it. Being forgiven is an amazing thing. And it's my heart's desire that today that not one of you leave this place. Or the, and listen, you don't have to leave this place without receiving the forgiveness of God. So often when people come into this church, and I understand it's larger than maybe what you're accustomed to, and, and, and maybe a service like this and a worship experience like that is something you're not maybe accustomed to. And, and typically, you know, I mean, the, the cross is here today, but... There's not, always, there's, there's not symbols and statues and, and all over the building. And, and sometimes people get kind of offended. They're like, well, where are all those things? Jesus didn't die so you could come into a building to feel God. Jesus died so God could go inside you and live in you. That's why he died. 
He didn't die so you could go into a building and call it the house of God. He died so he could live in you and call you the house of God. He said, I will walk with them. I will dwell in them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jesus died so that you no longer have to have pictures in the hotel room. You can open the door and walk out into the freedom. Your debt that's been canceled, you can now enjoy and stop trying to pay it through religious observations and observances. You don't have to, you don't have to do those things. There's a freedom that comes when you wake up in the morning and the burden of your sin is gone. And until you experience forgiveness from God, you will never, ever, ever be able to forgive yourself. The question I want to ask you today is this. Do you see yourself in light of your past? Or do you see yourself in light of what God has done for you in Jesus? Forgiving yourself is so important. You talk about a prison. There are people all over this room. There are people sitting out in the mallway right now watching this. People who will listen to this through the podcast. Watch it online or on television. And they are trapped in the fact that they can't forgive themselves. Let me give you an example of somebody. I promise you, it's not just one or two. Many people across this room. Maybe you, 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 you've struggled with addiction in your life. Alcoholism or drug addiction or some form of addiction that, that has made you unsafe to be around. And, and you don't want to be this way anymore. You've gone to rehab four or five times. You just, you just seem to, I just can't get through this. And, and you get to where you just, you can't even, li- you feel like you can't even live beyond the pain that you've been trying to mask, maybe for decades. And you certainly can't give, get past the pain that you've caused other people. You've watched the sorrow and the pain in your parents' eyes. And, and the times you've lied to them and misused them and mistreated them. And they keep loving you. Maybe they have to put some boundaries around you, but you know they love you and you know you've broken their heart. And, 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 you, and you've tried to make it better. You've tried to make 5,000 more promises. I promise you I'll never do it again. Then you do it again and you just impose on yourself a prison. People who don't forgive themselves impose punishment on themselves. Living in that realm of torture, people will punish themselves. Self-destructive behaviors in a way to earn or to pay penance for their wrongdoing. That if I hurt myself and harm myself, it will show you how little I think about myself. The reality of it is the reason you should forgive yourself is not because of any other reason other than God valued you enough to forgive you. God valued you enough to take your sin and cancel it. And I would ask you this, who are you to hold over yourself what the God of all creation no longer holds over you? I'm not talking about saying that what I did wasn't wrong and didn't affect people. But you will never live beyond your past until you learn to forgive yourself. And again, I'm not saying ignoring who you hurt. It might mean you need to sit down with people. It might mean you might need to sit down with your children or your spouse or whomever. You might be here today and ruined a marriage through adultery. Your kids have been splintered. And you think, oh, why'd you bring it up? The shame and the guilt. Please, I didn't come here to feel badly. Please. I wasn't even thinking about that till you said that. That's what religion does. It layers shame and guilt on you and says, now get better. Jesus says, I will take your sin. I will take your guilt. I will take your shame. I will forgive you. As far as the east is from the west, so far I will remove that transgression from you. Your sin, your iniquity, will rem- I'll remember no more. Then I'm going to throw a big old no fishing sign up and say, stay out. Don't go back and dig up dead bones. Don't go dig up bones. Randy Travis said that. Digging up bones, exhuming things that's better left alone. You didn't think I knew Randy Travis, did you? (laughs) I'm not much for music, but I remember Randy. He's saying digging up bones. That's what people do. They exhume things that's better left alone. And God said, let it go. And you can now live outside of that prison. Because when forgiveness occurs in your life, in any capacity, a, a, a captive goes free. When you receive forgiveness from God, you go free. You wake up in the morning free. It's incredible. You may have heard people say, man, I gave my life to Jesus and the sun seemed brighter, even in Pittsburgh. 
It just smells, smelled better. It's the room was in grayscale and now it's in color. And you're like, really? Because they're out of the prison. They're out of the drab room with the windows drawn and now they're walking in the light. When, a pris when, when forgiveness occurs, prisoners go free. When you're forgiven by God, oh, a freedom that happens in your life. It, there is no way to define it. And when you forgive yourself, there is a form of freedom that will come to you to where the person that God made you to be, the potential that he wrapped up inside, the precious gift that you are, can be realized. But until you learn to do that, you will live in the prison of your past and you will be in punishment that will be self-imposed the rest of your life while God has unlocked the door and said, walk out. So I would ask you, what are you doing in a prison cell when the door is wide open? And then lastly, I would encourage you this, that when you forgive other people, you let them go free. But you know, not only they go free, when you forgive, you go free. Because when you forgive, the prisoner you release is often you. Because some of the people you might need to forgive aren't even alive anymore. And yet, they've kept you imprisoned. Forgiveness is an incredible thing. And it has nothing to do with what you deserve. It is designed only in the context of mercy and grace. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, as we close, says this. And he, Jesus, canceled the debt. Everybody say, canceled the debt. Now remember, let's be real now. That's what makes some religious blah, blah, blah. Canceled the debt. That means if your debts are canceled, do you keep paying for them? Yes or no? No. Okay. Jesus canceled the debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow. He took away that record with its rules, and he nailed it to the cross. You know, today, I want you to leave experiencing the presence of God. These are a man and a woman that represent either you, I hope. And, uh, and here's what I want you to think of today. I, I don't want this to be some message. I want you to experience the forgiveness of God today. I want you, you as a person, I want you to impose your face here, your heart into these pictures. Are you going to let your life, your past, be nailed to that cross today? Are you going to let what Jesus did on that cross become real in your life? Listen to me, today, or are you going to leave here with just the, relig the religious image of it and the pretend religiosity of it? Jesus did not die for that reason. He died to make you free. And so today, as I come over to a cross symbolically, I want to symbolically put on this cross your past. When I nail these to this cross, it's my hope that you yourself will let what Jesus did for you happen and receive it. That you can have what, what Jesus did for you nailed on that cross and that you leave here today and I want you to see your past on that cross. I want you to see it nailed. Now today it was just an illustration, but 2,000 plus years ago, a Roman soldier knelt over the body of a savior and he took spikes and he drove those spikes through his hands and through his feet. And everybody there present that day could not see what God saw. What he saw was the debt held against you being canceled. And it was nailed to the cross. Between the body of a Savior and the wood of a cross was your past. The cross announces your past is over. And a resurrection announces a new life can begin. That's what Jesus died for. Not to make you religious. So, Pastor, look, I, it's Easter. I'm not a religious person. Good. Stay that way. Don't be religious. Have a relationship with the living Savior and walk with God. It's an incredible way to live. No, God doesn't want you to become religious. See, people think, of, oh, I'll, be, I'll walk with Jesus and I'll be weird. You're probably already weird. <laughs> Walking with Jesus ain't going to make you weirder. Unless you try to make yourself right with God, then you start to do all kind of crazy stuff. Why don't you just receive what Jesus did for you today? Why don't you just open your heart today and let him move in your life? I'm going to pray for two things today. And I'm going to ask you to open your heart to these two simple things today. The first I'm going to pray is for people to be able to forgive themselves who already know Jesus. And then secondly, I'm going to give an invitation for those of you who don't know that you've ever received Christ into your life. And I'd ask you to just remain seated. This is such a sacred time. Can I tell you the next five minutes are the most important five minutes that you will ever, if you don't know Jesus, listen to me, these next five minutes of your life 
are the most important five minutes you will ever live on your, in your entire life. What you do at the end of these five minutes will be something that will matter, will matter more than your job, more than where you live, more than your, all your problems going away. This lasts forever. Would you bow your heads with me, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed, <clears throat> if you're here today and you'd say, you know, Pastor John, I, I, I am a believer. I mean, I've given Jesus the lordship of my life. I know that I'm heaven bound because of Jesus, but I know that there are things behind me that I've said or that I've done that I just can't let go of. I, I feel the regret you talked about. I feel like I can't forgive myself. There are people that I've hurt that I can't make it right, and it haunts me. And I'm asking God today, by his grace, to nail that to this cross. I'm asking God to give me the grace today to forgive myself so that I can walk out of this prison, that I can stop imposing on myself a sentence that Jesus cried out and said that I'm acquitted. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if there are areas in your life that, where you know you haven't forgiven yourself and they've trapped you and you want the help of the Holy Spirit, the help of the mercy of God today to set you free, not in six weeks, today from that horrible, horrible condition. If you say, Pastor, that's me, I'll pray for you right where you're seated. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, just quickly, if that's you and you say, include me in that prayer, just simply raise your hand up real high then put it right back down. Thank you. Probably 40% of this room raised their hand. And 40% of you are in a prison and maybe Another 20% didn't raise your hand because the prison doors are so tight you can't even lift your hand. Well, let me tell you how good God is. If you want free and you didn't raise your hand, he still loves you enough to make you free. Just in your heart say, Lord, I can't lift my hand, but, you, but, by, but, but just see my heart go up to you. And you receive right now the mercy of God and you leave this place free, experiencing the freedom that only Jesus can provide. Let me pray for you that, that, on that first invitation. Father. I pray for every person that raised their hand that's trapped in their past. And Father, I thank you for the forgiveness that comes that only you can bring. And I thank you, Lord, that you canceled those debts, which listed all the rules that we had failed to follow. And you took away that record with all of its rules and you nailed it to the cross. And so in the name of Jesus, I proclaim over their, ho over their house, over their life, over all they touch and love, that yesterday is gone and forgotten and a new day has begun. That their past ended at a cross and at a resurrection, a new life has begun. And Father, I thank you now for a supernatural impartation of the Spirit of God in their life and heart to bring this reality to pass in their life. And I pray that in Jesus' name, and as heads remain bowed and eyes closed, if you're here this morning, and you've never given your life to the one who gave his life for you. Sir, ma'am, listen to me. You may be like the Pharisee who thinks you're okay with God. Let me tell you very clearly from Scripture, Jesus said, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. He said so. So I don't, I don't like that. It's irrelevant whether you like it or not. The reality is what, is what it is. You may not like sunrise, but it comes. Jesus died on the altar of a cross to pay the debt you could never pay. So if you're here today and you'd say, I don't know if I died today where I'd spend my eternity. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'd like to be included in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, I will pray for you right where you're seated. The whole church can pray the prayer out loud together with you. And he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And you will leave this room forgiven and cleansed and beginning a new life and a new journey walking with God in every day life. Don't, leave, don't sit here in this room deceived thinking, well, I must be a Christian because I'm born in America or I, I went to church or I've, been to, or I've been baptized or whatever. No, the only way you're made right with God is by inviting Jesus into your heart. He only comes by invitation. If you're not certain that you've done that, I want to pray with you today to invite you to invite Jesus into your heart. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as the Lord of your life, you'd say, Pastor, please include me in a prayer this morning to invite Jesus in my heart. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I will pray for you right where you're seated. I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you. This is about you receiving the Savior in your life. 
Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You'd say to me, Pastor John, please include me in that prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Would you simply right now lift your hand and I'll pray for you. Do it right now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Do it right now. Thank you. Hands are everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Be bold about it. Get out of that prison. You can put your hands back down. Now let me finally say this. If you didn't yet raise your hand, and you say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. You can see now that I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. But you want to be free. You want to receive Jesus. You believe he's the son of God, died on that cross, buried and rose from the dead to, to pay the debt for your sin. And you want to make him the Lord of your life today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you've not yet raised your hand. One last moment. You say, Pastor, please include me. Lift your hand right now and I'll pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, hands again everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud where you hear it with your very own ears. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you, never forsake you. And before we pray, let me tell you this. Come back to church and keep hearing messages like this that will make you free. Bring your kids so that they can live in the freedom that you never got to enjoy of walking with God. Make it a part of your life to come and fellowship with God's people and get around God's word and worship God together and have an experience with God every weekend to start your week in the presence of Almighty God, full of the Word of God and living your life on purpose. So if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud where you hear it. And Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you or forsake you. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you for canceling my debt. I thank you for nailing it to the cross. And I open the door of my heart and the door of my life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. I open the door of my heart. And Jesus, I invite you in. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin is washed away. My debt has been canceled. I am heaven bound. And I confess boldly that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. Give them a hand, would you?